Module 12, Part 2. Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. In this video, we're going to look at how to use reinforcement learning and Q-learning with Python. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. Before we get into using deep reinforcement learning, we're going to see how to use just regular reinforcement learning and what can truly be done with that. So we're going to learn about Q-learning and we're going to learn how to use the, essentially the mountain car. So the mountain car is a example in OpenAI Gem where we try to teach a underpowered car to make it up a mountain. So what I mean by underpowered car is we're going to go ahead and load it and see what happens if we give it just a very simple command. We're going to tell it to always do action two. Action two is apply right force. So try to just scale directly up the mountain and let's see what happens. Now, the way these work in OpenAI Gem is you're getting essentially a state returned to you each time. So we're getting the state, we're getting the reward and a value that tells us if we're done because you only have about 200 time steps to actually do this. State zero is the position, x location of the car. We don't really care about the y. Velocity is how fast the little car is moving. Positive is moving to the right, negative is moving to the left. And it just simply works its way up the, up the mountain and then it fails. So just applying a right word direction to it, notice it just, it just goes to the right, to the right, to the right up the mountain, and then it fails. So before I show you how to actually use this, let me run this just to show you how this interacts with Jupyter Notebooks, because it's a little bit hokey trying to get OpenAI Gem to work with a Jupyter Notebook, but if you're aware of what's going on, it won't be too bad. So if we click run, here we see the underpower car that we saw before. It's trying to get up the mountain and it's just failing. Now that that little window goes away. If we rerun it, notice the little window doesn't come back. It's probably behind the window or perhaps closed. You need to do a kernel reset just so that it comes back. Now, if I run it, you'll see the little car again. Now we'll look at more advanced car. This is still not using any sort of AI. This is me defining rules for it. So what I am doing here essentially is I'm keeping track of where we're at with how many steps we've had. The state is going to be returned to me. So that's essentially the element one is my velocity. If my velocity is positive, I'm going to go full on to the right, full force to the right and you can't go anything but full force. Either you're applying no power or you're applying full power in either left or right. If my velocity is negative, meaning I'm going the other way, then I apply force the other way. So what'll happen is this car will start out going up the hill, applying right force. It will get knocked back down the hill, go sliding back down. That'll flip the velocity and immediately it will start to apply power in the other direction. So whatever direction the car is heading, that is where we apply force. And that is enough to win the game. You don't necessarily do it the best that you can, but if we run this one, you can see it keeps applying force in its direction and it almost won that time. Now, this is a little bit random. There's randomness in there, so it won't, it won't win every single time, but you can see that was a heck of a lot better than the previous attempt where we just tried to directly scale the wall. Here we'll run it again. See, it keeps force in whatever direction it was going. It didn't make it to the flag, but we'll see how we can train something that does reach the flag. We're gonna use reinforcement learning for this. Reinforcement, I would consider this AI because it's the machine learning, but I would not consider this deep learning by any stretch of the imagination. What we're doing is we're updating a policy table. So this policy table tells the cart what to do in every single situation. Now we'll see that this doesn't work so well because on things like chess and go, which we finish this module out by looking at alpha zero, that table would have more cells in it than the known universe has atoms if you're dealing with chess or with go. However, what we're going to do here is we're going to create a table essentially for the state. 
So you can see the state here, this is the position, and this is the velocity. And then the reward, you don't actually get a reward until you beat it, until you get the car all the way up to the flag. So it's trying to get that reward by looking at what to do in each of these states. And what we're going to do is basically build a lookup table that says, if the position is here and the velocity is here, then do this. Now these are continuous numbers. Continuous numbers are hard to deal with for lookup tables. You have to band them or break them into buckets so that if the position is between this value and this value, do this. You'll have to do that. So we'll deal with that. The agent is the car. We're trying to teach the agent car to make it up the hill. The hill is in the environment, so it's interacting with it. The agent takes an action. We only have three actions we can deal with here, left, right, and no force at all. And then the environment, you have the state and the reward, so the state changes based on the action, and if you finally accomplish something good, you get a reward. It's like training a pet, like I show you in the introductory video for this course. So this whole thing, constantly iterating through, as the agent gets better and better at giving actions that give greater reward or eventual reward from the environment, that's how it knows how to build up those cells on the table. So it took this particular action, given this particular state, it learns if the reward was good, and it looks not just at the immediate reward, but the eventual reward. It updates that cell in the table so that we have a better instruction on what to do. Now you use this equation here, essentially, that is calculating the Q value. So in Q learning, the Q refers to the grid cells in the policy table. We're learning essentially what the Q value is. So in the table, we have one row for every possible value that the state can be in. And then the Q value, there's a Q value for each of the three actions. Whichever action has the greatest Q value, that's the one that we're going to do. So we update this by, now you'll see this a lot in machine learning algorithms. Alpha is a learning rate. So the fact that we have two coefficients essentially, and by the way, this this equation is spanning over two lines. That's why it looks kind of weird. This continues right up here. But you'll often see one minus something times something plus. This is just saying the, so say the learning rate was 0.7. This would be 70% would be here. 30% would be here because this would be 0.3. So the learning rate is dealing how much of the new learned value were adding in, but we're keeping some momentum, so to speak, of the old state. So if you made the learning rate 0.7, then 70% of the new Q value is going to be the new learned value, 30% is the old value. Now obviously, if you make it 1, then this cancels out, there'll be no old value whatsoever, and it's all new learning. That would be crazy. That would probably not converge terribly quickly, but you can experiment with it. I don't think it would converge at all, depending on the problem. And if you made it zero, then it would be all old value. It, that would do nothing. It would be completely stagnant. So this is a lot like momentum in neural networks. And then we're essentially adding in whatever the reward was, which might be negative, so that would penalize it and then a discount factor that has the S that is specifying how much of the ultimate reward or estimation of our ultimate future value, where we're ultimately going, the longer term, we'll see how that's calculated in the code. That is what the discount factor specifies. How much do we want it focused on the future? So the learning rate and the discount factor, those are the two that, that you would work with. So here we have calculate discrete state. That is taking those two continuous values and basically just bucketing them. I'm choosing how many buckets I want to have. I think I use 10. And we essentially just convert that into integers of which buckets it's in. So that gives you a nice grid of 10 by 10 if your bucket size is, is in fact 10. And you can specify buckets as a vector. So you can specify a different size for each of those two. We'll see where that's defined in a moment. Run game actually runs the game. We need to know the Q table. So that's the table that we're policy that it is slowly building up so that it knows what to do in each state. Render is true or false if we want to render this particular game. Most of the games we will not render. It would take too long. Should update specifies if we would like to update the weights, the Q table. We track if we're done. We get our first discrete state by resetting the environment. Now this is a stochastic reset, so it will put that cart at a random location 
in the field. So just because you have a policy table that won once, it may not win a second time. It has to improve better and better and better so that it's able to beat the somewhat random game. Then as we're running through, we look at essentially Epsilon, which is another one of these parameters. You hear about explore or exploit. Epsilon determines the degree to which we are going to explore or exploit. If we're exploring, then we essentially pick a random action. If we're exploiting, we're using the Q table that we already have. So we've already figured out some best actions. We know what the best action is, at least from our Q table at its current level of maturity. But if we choose to explore, we forego that and we just pick a random action for the cart. That gives some variety in there. And what we want to happen is we want this epsilon to slowly decay so that we become less and less willing to explore and more and more interested in exploiting what we've already found. We run the simulation step just like before on whatever action we've chosen up here, and we calculate what our new state is based on taking that step. We look at if we're successful. If we are successful, we mark that, we're done. Otherwise, we update the Q table. And this is essentially this equation in code. I don't think the equation is that bad, but it's the Python might make a little, a little bit more sense. So the maximum future value, that is looking at what does the Q table say to do for the new state that the action has moved us to. There's three actions, so it, it picks the Q value for the, the action that had the best outcome. Now what it does is it looks at the current Q value is just a lookup with the action in the Q table. And then we perform this calculation. So we know our current, we know the future. It's just a Q table lookup. Looking up the Q value for the current, looking up the Q value for where we move to, and we simply calculate the new Q value and we replace it. So this is how we're slowly tweaking these reward Q values because these Q values, the quality values, specify of the three actions for any given state that the environment can be in, which has the greatest probability of leading to success. And if we wish to render, we call the environment render and we draw what the current cart looks like. I'm going to run this just so that it's defined and we have it available in memory. These are the constants that I'm choosing for this. We're going to go for 10,000 episodes for training. Discount is going to be 95 and the learning rate is 0.1. Grid size is only 10 by 10. So we're going to have about 100 values in our queue table. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start it running you will begin to see the output from the car down here. So that's a thousand episodes. It's not very good yet. It's still just rocking back and forth. When we get the next update at 2000, it's getting better there. The Q tables are getting better. It still has not had a single success. And it did get one success there, so it does seem to be getting better. We'll see the percent increase likely there as it as it learns more. Yeah, it was it actually had 40 successes out of a thousand, not great, but it had a four percent. And it just keeps updating that Q table each time. We're up to 35%, and you can see one of the wins up there. Again, these are random, so the one that it happens to show you up on the display may not be a truly uh, successful run, like there it was not. And this value increases. Now there is some randomness to it, so it's gotten up to 70%. It could degrade or it could continue to get better. It's going to go all the way up to 10,000. So there we see it's at 93%. It's really starting to, to do well. Okay, so it's just about done. We'll see what the final result is here. It it got up to 93%. It did degrade a bit here, and that does happen as it settles into local minima or other things such as that. So you'll probably want to run it for more than 10,000 episodes, but you can see clearly we got to a pretty good cart strategy. Now this one here, you could run it and it would basically, it would not update the weights, but it would run it. So if you just wanted to run a few car iterations of your own to see what it would do, that would work just fine. Here I dumped the Q table. So you can see what the Q table is really doing. Here are all the velocity buckets and here are all the position buckets. So you can see when position is high and velocity is high, the various things that it is doing. 
Zero means it is simply keeping the car the same. A heat map would be an interesting thing to display here too because you could see graphically some of the patterns that it that are emerging as it learns the best policy to drive the cart up the hill. But if you want to see what's going on in its brain, this shows you the Q table. So this is simply the lookup. It puts the velocity and the position into these buckets, finds, finds the value. In each of these locations, in each of these cell locations, there would be three numbers that tell you what the probability of each of the three actions were, the, or not the probability, but the essentially the probability of that action. In each of those cells, there's three numbers corresponding to the three actions. Those are the three Q values. So whichever action has the greatest Q value, that's the one that is going to typically be taken. Here I'm just showing you for each of those three action Q values, which of them truly had the highest, the highest Q value. So if action one had the highest Q value, that's what I'm showing you here. That's what that argmax is doing when I'm building up this frame. This content changes often, so subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on this course and other topics in artificial intelligence.